Hi, I'm Abe Fettig. I'm the lead developer of FilmLab, the app for digitizing film. And today I want to show you what's new in FilmLab 3.1. So let's fire up FilmLab. And here I've got some images I scanned. These are from a family trip we took across the United States last summer. These are shot on a half frame Olympus Pen F camera. And you can see as I did my scans, I purposely captured a little bit of the previous and next frame for each one. And I did that to give me flexibility uh, to be able to stitch them together and make diptychs and triptychs if I choose to do that. So if I take a peek here um, at one of my scan negatives, this is Kodak 400 GC. And what I'm gonna do first is I'm just gonna get my crop so that I'm only looking at the negative and not um, my film carrier or any other background material. That'll give film lab a better basis for doing auto settings. So having done that, I will copy my crop rotate from my first image, select all, and then paste edits. And now I've got all my images cropped and ready to work with. Looking at these, I can still see that they're slightly at an angle. So let me just correct that. I'll use the crop tool, get things lined up straight. And then once again, I can copy, crop, rotate, select all and paste. And now those are all lined up. So one new thing in FilmLab 3.1 is now we have the file name here under the image. That didn't used to be there, which made it hard sometimes to know which file you were editing. If you want to turn that back off, you can do it from the view menu, uncheck show file names in folder view, and it'll go back to how it was before, but uh, it's nice to have that on most of the time. So now I want to show you a new feature in FilmLab 3.1 that uh, really makes batch workflow easier. FilmLab has the idea of profiles, which is that um, it has information about different film stocks and different backlights, and it uses those to get the most accurate colors when it's converting uh, a negative to a positive. So previously, every time you edited an image in FilmLab 3, you would have to start from the beginning. It would take the first backlight and the first film stock on the list, and if you wanted something different, you had to go in and choose, which was really annoying, especially when you had a large number of images to edit. So you'll see what happens now. I'm gonna batch convert these all at once select all, and I say process as color negative. And now before it does the conversion, FilmLab is gonna ask me what color negative profile information I want to use. So in this case, I'm using the negative supply CRI 95 light that is the backlight that I use to scan this film. But if I was using a Veloy light, a skier or Sinista light, I could choose that from the options here. And internally, FilmLab actually uh, knows about the exact spectral profile of those lights, how much energy it's emitting at each part of the visible spectrum. So it uses that to fine tune its calibration. And then for film stock, um, FilmLab 3 has added some, or excuse me, FilmLab 3.1 has added some new film stock profiles. And one of them is Kodak Ultramax 400, also known as 400 GC. And that's the film that we shot with here. So now that I've selected that, I can say apply to 78 images. And FilmLab is gonna go through, um, convert each image from a negative to a positive using the profile information that I selected. So now FilmLab has done automatically converting my images. And now if I want to, I can go in and fine tune each one. Well, as of today with FilmLab 3.1, I would say our auto settings are a good starting point, but uh, they're definitely not as good as what um, a good photographer is able to pull out of these images. So for best results, you're gonna to wanna to go in and edit the exposure and other settings for each, each one. Let's just pick one of these images and do an edit on it. I'll pick this one here. This is in downtown North Platte, Nebraska, which is a really cool town with a lot of neat old buildings in it. For this one, I'll just crop it down to the frame plus a little bit of the border. And I'm gonna set my density that controls basically the exposure uh, the amount of virtual dye that's used to create this image. And then I'm going to play with color balance. A little tip on color balance. Sometimes it's hard to get exactly right. A couple things you can look for 
One is the color of the sky. Uh, most of us are very familiar with the shade of blue that the sky is, especially in midday. So that can help you uh, see what needs to be color balanced. And also if you can find neutrals and look for subtle differences. So in this case, some of the sidewalk material is made of um, maybe a newer cement. Some of it is made of this older material, which is a little reddish. And if my color balance is wrong, those colors are all gonna look more similar to each other. When I get the color balance just right, there'll be a moment where they kind of pop and all of a sudden I can see the subtle differences more clearly because I've removed the color cast. So we'll go with that for now. That's our, our edited image. Uh, while we're here, let me show you a couple of new things in the FilmLab 3.1 user interface. First, we have a new settings screen. I can see my account details. The new defaults tab lets me set default values to use when editing a new image. So if you prefer more or less noise reduction or sharpening, you can set those here and whatever you set will be applied automatically when you edit a new image. In the graphics tab, now you can choose your graphics renderer. So in this case, I'm on an Apple device. I can choose whether I want to use Metal or OpenGL. There's also Swift Shader, which is a non-GPU based shader that uses your CPU for graphics. That's going to be very slow, so I don't recommend turning that on unless you're debugging. So that's the new settings screen. But now that I'm done editing this image, let's export it. And that's where you'll see some nice improvements in FilmLab 3.1. We have a totally new export dialog that has some enhanced features. First, under Format, we now have a new edition, JPEG XL. This is really nice when you want to export a 16-bit image that gives you more color detail, but you don't want the giant file size that comes with TIFF, since TIFFs are uncompressed or only have lossless compression. With JPEG XL, I can uh, choose to use lossless compression if I want, which will still be uh, quite a bit smaller file size than TIFF since it's a newer format with better technology. But if I do lossy, I can actually adjust the settings. I can do, I can adjust distance, which is basically um, how much detail I'm willing to give up. Higher distance sacrifices detail to smaller for smaller file size. And then effort is just how much CPU time I want to spend on trying to optimize for the smallest size. Uh, as effort goes up, file size will drop a bit, but the time it takes to export um, and potentially to load the image later will take longer. So I'm going to set these both to uh, fairly low settings because I want to preserve high quality. And then now in the color space tab, previously FilmLab was limited to sRGB. Now we can do three new color spaces, Display P3, Adobe RGB, or ProPhoto RGB. So say I want to work with uh, this image in another application and do more post-processing on it. I'm going to choose ProPhoto RGB. That's the biggest color space that gives me the most room to work uh, as I open this in another imaging application. So I'll go ahead and export that image. And now I've got it as a JPEG XL. So the fact that we have these new color spaces in FilmLab 3.1 brings up a question, which is, are there colors captured on film that we haven't been able to see uh, in their, their full saturated detail if we were using the sRGB color space. And I think this is important, an important question because if you've been sending your film to a photo lab, uh, as, as most of us have, and getting your scans back from the lab, you've probably been getting back JPEGs that are in the sRGB color space. I'll just talk about color spaces for a minute. You may or may not be familiar with this already. So what we have here is a big horseshoe shaped area. That's the CIE 1931 color space. And that basically represents all the colors that the human eye can see for a typical human eye. And going from the center out, these colors are getting more and more saturated. So in the middle, we've got white and colors that are close to white. As we get out to the very edges of this horseshoe shape, we're seeing colors that are that are pure spectral colors, like a very, very pure red or a very, very pure green. And then the triangles that are overlaid here show color spaces that we use for editing images on computers. The one in the middle, which is a little brighter than the others, outlined here in orange, is sRGB. And the sRGB color space was developed um, when images were starting to get shared on the internet. And it was basically based around the kind of colors that you'd be able to see in a typical monitor at the time. 
Well, since then, displays have gotten more powerful uh, and are capable of showing more colors, especially if you're using uh, a high-end monitor or a modern mobile device. You probably can see colors that are outside of the sRGB color space. And some of them that are highlighted here that FilmLab now supports are P3 that's highlighted in green. You can see it's basically similar to sRGB, but bigger. It allows for more saturated colors. Adobe RGB is smaller than P3 in some areas, but does come up a little bit higher into the greens. And then in the dotted lines here, you see Pro Photo RGB, which is a really big triangle that uh, pulls in almost all of the visible colors from uh, the CIE color space representing what humans can see. So I did a little experiment, and what this shows is some of the output colors that FilmLab is capable of producing, which are based on emulating the dye colors that would have been in color paper that you would print in a dark room. And you can see that some of these colors, especially the deeper blues and greens and yellows, are outside of the sRGB gamut. That's this triangle here. So basically, FilmLab has been able to produce colors internally that haven't been visible externally because we were only exporting sRGB. If we compare that to the P3 color space, we can see that using Display P3, much more of the potential output colors of FilmLab are now visible in the color space. There's still a few outliers here in the deep uh, blue, bluish greens. And then if we go to Profoto, Profoto is such a big color space, it easily fits everything that FilmLab could possibly output. So what that means, uh, in theory, is that if I take images that have very saturated colors in the yellows, the bluish greens, uh, maybe even the reds, and I export one as Display P3 and one as sRGB from FilmLab, I should actually be able to see a difference. There should be more saturated colors that all of a sudden become visible that weren't saturated before. So I went through and picked a few images that I thought might work for that and exported them. And let's take a look. So here's one, this is a sunny day and it's got some bright orange colored items in it, these clay pots and the sofa. I'm looking at the sRGB version right now. And when I switch to the P3 version, it's a subtle difference, but there's more detail here in the, the deep oranges. Uh, it looks a little more washed out in sRGB. I'm getting more deep saturated color in the display P3 version of that image. Here's another example. This one's pretty subtle, but I've got a deep green highway sign. And in the shadow part of this image, when I switch between sRGB and P3, I can, I can see a difference. So all the other colors in the image that are inside of the sRGB color space, no difference in color as I switch between sRGB and P3, but the few colors that are outside of sRGB, now I'm getting more accurate color when I view them in P3. And this one, uh, there's a bright red umbrella here in the foreground. When I switch from sRGB to P3, I can see that that red getting uh, deeper and more saturated. So if you're watching this video on uh, a monitor that doesn't support the P3 color space, or perhaps YouTube's encoding has made it more difficult to see those changes in color, you may not be seeing exactly the same thing of, of what I'm seeing here on my screen. Um, but the point is it works in theory and it works in practice. If you have images with these very saturated colors and you use FilmLab 3.1, you may be able to see colors that you couldn't see before. Now, one limitation that I want to point out is that the rendering area here of FilmLab, the FilmLab editor, is still limited to sRGB only, even if you're using a display capable of uh, a wider gamut color space. That's something that we'll fix in an upcoming version. But for now, if you want to actually see the differences in color space, you have to export two versions of the file and compare them. But I'd love to see the results that you get especially if you have images that were shot in very colorful environments, like if you're outside in the summer taking pictures of very saturated objects, I think you'll see a difference in what you can get uh, using FilmLab 3.1. And that's exciting because it means that there might be uh, colors in our images that we've just never quite seen before if we've been get getting photos back from a system that only supported sRGB color. There's one more thing I want to show you in FilmLab 3.1, and that's that FilmLab is now available for Linux. We're calling this a beta because it hasn't been uh, fully tested on a wide range of Linux distributions yet, 
But just to show you how you can use Film Lab, I'm, I'm using Debian Linux 12 here. And I'm going to go to Film Lab Desktop on the Film Lab website, click the download button, switch to beta releases, and then I can download a Linux app image in either x64 for Intel or ARM64 for ARM systems. In this case, I'm using an ARM system, so I'll download the app image. I'll open that folder. And there's one thing I need to do before I can use this app image file, which is I need to make it executable. And I'll do that here by opening the properties and clicking executable as program. Depending on your Linux distro, the process you use to make it executable might be different, or you might do it based on the command line. But now that I've done that, I can right click it and click run. And it starts up. And now I've got Film Lab running on my Linux system. So if you're using Linux, I'd love to have you try the Film Lab 3.1 beta, see how it works for you, especially if you're using a Raspberry Pi or another um, device like that. Please let me know how Film Lab works and what kind of results that you get. So that's Film Lab 3.1. Uh, it was five months from Film Lab 3 to Film Lab 3.1. Going forward, we're going to try for a quarterly release schedule. So it should be about three months from now that Film Lab 3.2 comes out. And Many of the features that were included in, in Film Lab 3.1, we prioritize based on your feedback as customers. Uh, I also know that there's things that you're waiting for for Film Lab 3.2 and beyond. So just to review some of the things on our roadmap, things that people have been asking for are histograms, uh, automatic cropping, uh, the ability to export as raw files, um, more profiles for more film stocks and light sources, and uh, stitching inside the app. So you can take multiple images and then stitch them together to create a single output file. I can't promise that all those features will make it into Film Lab 3.2, but they are on our roadmap and you can look forward to them in the future. So thanks for watching. Uh, please check out Film Lab 3.1. I hope you have a great time converting your film scans with Film Lab and I'll see you next time.